Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to our Sunday School. I'm glad you're here today. We're in uh, Mark chapter 6 today. So you're going to eat on over to Mark chapter 6. Get there in just a second. If you've got your handout on your table, go ahead and flip over to the back side of your handout. At the very bottom. And this is our weekly homework. We just want to walk through and talk for a second about uh, how did we do this week with this. So just for a second, maybe longer than a second, um, take a second and just look at numbers one through six and in your head, did you do that? Did we pray for help in understanding Mark? Did we hear Mark multiple times? Did we think about Mark often? Did we talk with someone about Mark? Did we share insights about Mark? And did you invite a member and a non-member? Remember, these are the membership expectations. So if you are a member of our Sunday school, this is what we do. Just FYI, that's part of it. And then number two, before we get into asking the question, uh, Mia culpa. Uh, last week, I, in the middle of Sunday school, was asked a question, and uh, as shocking as it might sound, in no way, shape, or form did any of steps uh, one through five before I answered the question. And I got the question radically wrong. Uh, and the question was uh, about one of Jesus' brothers, Joseph, uh, and where Joseph was and how he shows up in the New Testament, specifically in Mark. And uh, I made the comment that in one of the other Gospels, he shows up at the cross. Uh, because that's what I thought I had recalled reading. And I was wrong. He was not at the cross. He was somewhere else. So because I did not stop and pray for help in understanding Mark and go, here, Mark, actually look at the text, think about it in the moment, I got the question wrong. So, physician, heal thyself, right? Um, this applies to me as well, and I will tell you, in the moment, it is easy to go, oh yeah, I know the answer to that, instead of, let's just take a second and go look at the text and make sure we got it. So, with that, let's look at our question that we usually start with each week, which is, what is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? Remember, this is not what have you learned. This is what is he doing in you. So what is he doing in you from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? Yes, sir. So there's been three, uh, three things that kind of lined up with this thing. Uh, we told them to go out and talk to the people just carrying the two two things about where, you know, yep. know where Matthew said, and show it, you know, the, that you can't serve two masters, you can't serve God and money. Then it gives this huge, not huge, but several verses of God will take care of you, basically. Okay. And then there was uh, a tweet that you liked also. And it was about that. I like a lot of tweets, so don't take my tweets as theological <laughs> endorsements. But it was like the Jackie Some Wilson. of them are really awesome comics on the internet. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, oh, the Jackie Hill Perry quote. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, just thinking about that, thinking about them going, him saying, hey, you don't need anything. This is what I want you to go do. Basically, he's going to take care of that. Or, they're not serving two masters. They're not so concerned about career. They're not concerned about all this stuff. And I think that's what Jackie Hill Perry's quote was kind of talking about. You can hustle and you can grind, but in the end, it's God that gives the increase. And so anyway, so he is the source of ultimate source of our provision, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about trust. Do I trust him? Right. What well, I felt miserably. I mean, that, that's a, 
That's the tough thing. I trust him with stuff that I may can control. The, mm -hmm. the stuff that I can't control, mm -hmm. who boy. That's a, that, that's anxiety will pop up in the quickness. Stuff like <laughs> stuff like March twentieth. Who? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it is it is truly shocking. And and this is somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, when am I learning through all of the chronic pain issues that Caleb is going through. Uh, and, well, there's like a thousand things, maybe two of them that I'm comfortable talking about. And one of them is, like, Jules and I are not in control. <laughs> like, it is just, this is, a, this is a conversation where we have a voice and a plea and a beg, um, but we are not the sovereign king of the universe. And it is really good. Right, because you guys might not fare too well if I was the sovereign king of the universe. Because <laughs> so, um, I'd focus on me. Right, so, yeah, I'd focus on, I'd focus on me. Go on me. Right? Um, yeah. Good. good so. And that's an insight on like what we're going to study today, not something that we've studied. Yeah, good. Excellent. All right, I saw a hand. I saw a hand. I didn't know where. Okay, excellent. I thought that too, and, and that was on this week's too, on 6 7. That, um, go out, he says to go out two by two, that God is so good that, oh, this is another thing online. Oh, no. I do research for his research because I don't understand all of it. Somebody came with notes already written out about, like, here we go. <laughs> this is as Pentecostal as I get right there. <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> if I really get Pentecostal, I'll do it like on my toes. <laughs> I love my Pentecostal brothers if you're watching. That video. <laughs> and sisters. Um, I thought that when he was talking about that is I focused in on it. I just love the fact that our strength comes from God but many of our needs might come from individuals mm -hmm. living out Christ in front of us yes. and so that is just I'm yep. awed at the fact and when I first met when I first when I first met when I first heard um, Moses and when I read Exodus and I had the time to wear it. You will one day. When, <laughs> when, um, it's a sobering thought. Yeah. <laughs> God was so good to Moses uh, by letting Aaron come into his life. That's right. And, you know, that's just another aspect of that. He, he doesn't want us all, always to go do it alone. Yeah. That when we really struggle, he sees that we need two by two, not only to keep us accountable, but to share wisdom and discernment from another and another set of eyes to, to not just, you know, I That's just awesome. love that. That's so beautiful. I don't know that I'd ever considered Aaron and uh, Moses <laughs> being two by two, but uh, yes, <laughs> I like that. That is good. All right, let's jump off into Mark chapter six. We're going to read Mark chapter six. I promise I'm not doing it. Well, I might be. <laughs> you know, we're going to talk about unclean spirits today, so. <laughs> I know somebody who's stronger. All right, so. <laughs> I'll try to be stoic and still today, we'll see. All right, Mark chapter 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages, teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, 
but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil, many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. And some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. And many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away and go into the country, surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate of the loaves were five thousand men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd. And after he had get, taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages and cities or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. So today we start a new section uh, in Mark chapter 6. We're starting in verse 7. And I'm going to lay even odds that we don't get off of page 171 today. But we'll see. So verse 7. 
And he called, so who's the he? Jesus. So Jesus called the twelve. So who are the twelve? The disciples, right? These that he's called specifically by name. Who does this group include? Who? Matthew and who? Mark was not in this group, no. There you go. This is good to know, right? Yes. He was not one of the apostles. That's good to know. <laughs> who else? So Matthew was there. Who else? Peter, James, and John. Who else? Who? Not Joseph, no. That's one of his brothers. Let's back up. Let's back up. Let's look at... So Mark chapter 1, verse 16, he calls Simon and Andrew, right? Going a little further, you see James and John. So Simon, Andrew, James, and John. And then we see that he calls uh, Matthew or Levi in uh, Mark chapter 2, verse, uh, the section called verse 13. And then uh, if you go over to Mark chapter 3, verse 13, this is where he calls the 12. So the list is here. So Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, I'm in verse uh, 16, 316, uh, 13, yeah, 316. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, uh, to whom he gave the name uh, Bonerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. Is that it? Judas. Judas. And Judas, Iscariot, who betrayed him. So let's go back over to Mark 6. It is the cord. I am doing it. Okay. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> Reminds me of one of my favorite John Piper quotes. Um, I'll paraphrase. Uh, don't underestimate your ability to self-deceive yourself. <laughs> it's really good. So, verse 7, six, uh, chapter 6, verse 7, and he called the twelve. So this is that group. And so we'll skip ahead just a second. So they go, and do they do what he tells them to do? Yes. Yes. Do they do it successfully? Yes. Okay. Does it say that any of them do not do it successfully? No. So would it be safe to assume that from the text, we can understand that they all did it successfully? Yes. Okay. Who does the group include? Judas. Judas. So... I'm going to hit this like nine times through this section. Just because somebody does or says something powerful or interesting does not mean they are playing on Christ's side. Okay. Jesus actually directly addresses this later else, elsewhere. Uh, many will say to me, uh, Lord, Lord, have we not done great works in your name? And they were doing this in his name. But uh, let's, let's be really careful. So he called the twelve... Can you say and that again? <coughs> yes, which part? Just because. Oh, I don't know that I can. Uh, just because I may well say it different. Just because you do something flashy or sounds good, doesn't mean that you are uh, actually a believer. Thank you. Yep. So he called the twelve and began to send them out. Now this, the the began here is interesting because what has Jesus been doing up to this point in Mark? Actually, it's this way. Up to this point in Mark. Who's been doing the work? Jesus. Jesus has been doing the work, right? Who's been watching? Disciples. Disciples. This is what being a disciple is. You stand really close to the rabbi. You understand what he does. You learn how to do this. And then at some point, the rabbi is going to go, and you go. And this is the first little inkling of that. So he began to ascend. And this is a, a present active. It's, it's a, a repeated kind of ascending. This was not just a one-time sin. This was... This was uh, several times this would have happened. So they've been watching him do this for several chapters, this casting out demons and healing. And he begins to send them out uh, two by two. So if you've got 12 people and you're going two by two, it's your math question for the day. How many groups do you have? Six groups. And somebody is paired up with who? Judas. 
Do we have a report in the scripture that that somebody comes back and goes, he's an imposter? No. No. But he hoodwinked them all the way through. All the way through. It's shocking. It's absolutely incredible. I don't want to make this all about Judas, but I just want to make sure you understand. You can do ministry with somebody. <clears throat> Stand right here, just like this. <laughs> you can do ministry with somebody. Like, interesting, amazing stuff. And they not actually be a believer. So, Mitch, yes, sir? It's possible that Judas did I would totally, wholeheartedly agree with that. Yes, that's exactly right. He would have been self-deceived as well. Who is the great deceiver? Satan. That was his daddy. That's right. Because also, yes, sir. When uh, uh, Jesus said, "The person who betrays me will dip his bread in yes. wine," Judas himself didn't even know. That's right. He did that. So that also shows that he was also not. There you go. And the the people sitting around the table, yeah. like he says this, and then he does it, right. and everybody should have gone like. Did y'all see that? Yeah. And nobody does that. It's shocking to me. But anyway, all right, back to six. Uh, he called the twelve. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority. So let's talk about this, this giving here for just a second. So he gave. It's imperfect active. So this is something they did not have. They had to receive. So he gave to them this authority. We're going to hang out on this word for just a minute. So this is uh, privilege or capacity or freedom or mastery or I think in this particular context, this delegated influence is probably a really good definition for this particular verse. We're going to look for a minute at these uh, verses that we have listed here. So Mark 1, 22. I thought I was being still. Mark 1, 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them, this is Jesus, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes, yes. right? Mark 1, 27, we come down, they were all amazed that they questioned him among themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? So this is, Jesus is demonstrating this authority. Uh, 2, 10, says, uh, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. So he has authority to teach, he has authority to forgive sins, which those two things alone that's, that's two pretty awesome things to put in the authority jar, right? Uh, 315 I'm sorry guys maybe I'll let it dangle, maybe that's better that's okay, we'll try that ooh, ooh <gasps> this is me dancing by the way, this is as far as it gets and those of you who can see my feet, they don't move it's <laughs> Flesh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that brief review, brother. Oh, I was there. All right, three fifteen. So we've got uh, he appointed the twelve and have a, that he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. This is something that he's going to give them. In six seven, we see the verse itself. In eleven twenty eight, there's a lot going on in, in eleven about authority. So the, the heading of this in the ESV actually says the authority of Jesus challenged. And they came again to Jerusalem in 27. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Who does that sound like? What question does this sound like? Same. Yes. But what other question that we've studied so far in Mark does this sound like? Who gave this to you? Where would you get this? Yeah, his hometown, right? The, the people in his hometown, they knew him. And they were like, whoa, where'd you get this? This is different. So where'd you get this? And he says, Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question. Answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. So it's trivia time. What was the baptism of John? From heaven or from man? Answer me. The problem occurs. And they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say, now, it, this is not about the answer. This is about uh, uh, messaging and signaling to the audience. So if we say from heaven, he'll say, then why didn't you believe it? But if we say from man, they were afraid of the people, for they all held, the people all held that John was really a prophet. So the answer Jesus, we do not know. 
And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then 1334, the last time it shows up in Mark. So this is start at 32. But concerning the day or the hour, this is when he's going to return. No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. That word in charge, that's the word for authority. Which is interesting, because that's a really good picture of what Jesus is actually going to do. He's going to go on a journey away from here and leave his servants with the authority to go carry out the work that he's supposed to do. Jesus doesn't just pick a random metaphor. These are intentional. It's one of the things that makes him a master teacher. So from Mark, we understand a little bit about authority, but Mark doesn't ever directly address where Jesus' authority comes from. So we kind of got to go outside of Mark to see that. So let's look at uh, Matthew 28, 18. I know, we're going outside of Mark. Don't tell him. Let's look at verse uh, 16. We'll start there. Now the 11 disciples, now we're down to 11 because Judas, uh, went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth. All right, so Venn diagram time. What part of the universe does all heaven and all earth include? All. All of it. Okay, so there's... No aspect of anything that is not included in this statement. All right? So all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who, perchance, would have the authority to do such a thing? Let's be specific. God the Father. That's right. God the Father. So then, he, so he declares... By the, the, the authority that he has, and then he gives them the Great Commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. <clears throat> so this is where his authority comes from. Let's look at John 5, 27. And then had a panic moment. I thought, nope, that didn't have anything to do with authority. That's not so this is, uh, let's start with verse 25. Um, the section title here is The Authority of the Son. So truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming, an hour is coming, and is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. So, power to heal, cast out demons, uh, forgive sin, execute judgment, all authority in heaven and earth. And then your question a while ago, I love your question, the answer to your question when you said the devil, because look at Luke chapter 4, verse 6. It's very interesting what the devil actually offers to Jesus at the temptation of Christ. So he's full of the Holy Spirit in verse 1. He returned from the Jordan and led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. The devil comes to him and says, If you're the Son of God, command the Son to be bred. Uh, man shall, uh, Jesus responds. The devil took him up, I'm in verse 5, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Is that a true statement? I'm going to have to object to the devil's lie here. Deception. Who's he trying to deceive? <laughs> Truth. <laughs> Incarnate. The very son of God. The, the, the audacity 
of this attempt is astounding, right? Yeah. I mean, could Satan have been deceived? Maybe. Doesn't forgive him, right? So, just a bit about authority. So this is where Je Jesus' authority comes from the Father himself. Right? So when we go back to Mark chapter 6 and look in uh, this verse 7, and we see two by two he sends them out and gave them authority. Now, I want to be careful and I want to bound it. I'm a mathematician. Things are true within certain limits here. Okay? What did he give them authority over? Everything. What did he give them authority over? In the verse, in verse 7, it's stated very clearly. What did he give them authority over? Uh, in the verse, in verse 7. Look at the verse, in verse 7. What did he give them authority over? What do the words say? Over the unclean spirits, right? That's what they got authority over right here. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Mastery privilege, but that was just a temporary authority. I mean, is that also good question? Because we, we can't assume, but is that part of one of those particles, adjective type? <laughs> 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 those things. Is the verb parsing such that this is permanent? I think that's the question you're asking. Yes. Uh, so is that is that such that it's permanent? It says imperfect active indicative. So indicative is a statement of fact that it just occurs. Active is uh, it's being given to them. It's something is happening to the subject. Or he is actually the one doing the giving. He is, Jesus is the subject here. He's given the given them. Right. Sorry, I had that backwards. And then the imperfect. You got your chart in the back of your mark? What's the imperfect? Some of you are like, what? What? Yes. I get cheat sheets. Not the picture. It should just be a one pager. Ah, here we go. This is homework for next week. Aha! Imperfect. Good. I'll post a link to that on the Our Sunday School Facebook page, too. So, so he gives them authority over the unclean spirits. You know what? I think that's going to be a good place to stop today. point in two minutes. So, yes, sir. Sorry to jump ahead. No, you're great. I remember reading in Mark that in Mark 9, they actually had an issue where they could not, in substance themselves, could not actually drive out the spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took the town actually come together and praying to drive out that spirit. And, they, and that's when they came and asked Jesus, like, why can we not do it? Because this type of spirit took prayer, not yes. you. You remember in Mark when what? That they actually no, no, no. You remember in Mark when you were doing what? When I was reading. When you were reading it. Oh. <laughs> so you're telling me it's helpful if you read the text to understand. Yes, I think that's helpful. Good. So one of the things that we do that is uh, shockingly inappropriate is we tend to study uh, little verses at a time. And these books were intended to be read uh, holistically. Right, you, you get this gospel, you read the whole thing. Um, one of the best ways to study the Bible. <laughs> one of the, I'm good. I just got another minute. One of the best ways to study the Bible is not to read just a couple of verses at a time, but to read the entire book over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And if it's a long book, then it's going to take you longer. And if it's a short book, it won't take you as long. But read the book over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again fantastic way to study and understand 
what the author, both the human and the divine author, are actually trying to communicate through the entire story. Mm -hmm. You also tend to not get too hyper-focused on one little part, mm -hmm. and you pull that thread way out of whack, and you end up with a hole in your theology. It's Jim, not good. the best illustration of that, and I'll never, ever forget this, is right up here, is the table that we had. Oh, yeah. With all the different Legos oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that were yeah. set up. That was a long setup, but it was a good illustration. <laughs> but, you know, it helped me to understand why sometimes denominations focus on certain things yep. or they have certain characteristics. Right. It's because they focus on one of the little pieces instead of going to the end and looking at all the right things. You were talking about the system, systematic, systematic theology, theology. study. Yeah. 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 Which is valuable, it's yeah, not 47 year study through systematic theology. <laughs> yes. I'm still amazed that we survived. <laughs> well, I feel like I understand it, at least the structure of it at, at this point, so that'd be helpful. Anyway, all right, so uh, part of your homework is to go look up the imperfect tense. It will, in fact, help a little bit answer your question, Miles, uh, but Mark itself is, you know, the structure of Mark is one that doesn't leave you hanging with these big theological question, because Mark's a get-to-the-point kind of guy. He's going to resolve this stuff in the narrative itself. So. All right, so on your tables, you should have a weekly update. Uh, please notice that there's a yellow highlight on your weekly update today. Uh, Easter at Coolidge is coming up. Our class uh, has been asked to... I better not do that. Our class has been asked to lead the setup and takedown component of Easter at Coolidge this year. So we will be, uh, you'll get more information about this over the next coming weeks uh, and the uh, details around this. So just be aware that assignments are generally being made to uh, teams relative to Sunday school classes this year. So just heads up, more information to come. Is that the most know. physically fit? Yes. <laughs> well, so when, when Ethan Anderson uh, called me about this and he gave me the options, I said, well, now my back's not broken. How about we do that? So he was like, that sounds good. And those will actually follow through. We will get it done. Yes, yes. we will get it done. So with that, uh, if you'll take a moment and pray over the prayer request, pick one of the sections, uh, pray over each one of those prayer requests in a section. When you're finished praying as that over that section as a table, uh, you are dismissed to go and to worship the one who can hand out authority. I mean, isn't that incredible? Like, it's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And as we go through Mark, we will see what authority he has given us as well. That's a fun look too. So, with that, thanks for coming to our Sunday school today, guys.